November 26, 1943, skies above Bremen, Germany. Frost clung to the canopy as Major Francis Gabby Gabreski glanced at his altimeter, 28,000 feet. Below, a swarm of black dots, German BF 110s climbed to slash into the bomber stream. He rolled his P 47 Thunderbolt inverted, the horizon flipping upside down, and pushed the nose toward Earth. Air screamed along the fuselage. The altimeter spun backward. Speed crept past 480 miles per hour. The controls stiffened, the world narrowed, and the squadron behind him followed into the sun. In seconds, the massive fighters became streaks of silver lightning. The German pilots never saw them coming. Browning 50 caliber guns thundered eight of them per jug, belching over a hundred rounds a second. Tracer fire stitched across the sky, tearing into twin engine interceptors that moments earlier had been predators. Now they were prey, falling in fire and smoke. When Gabreski leveled out, the bombers were untouched and the radio crackled with victory calls. He would later jot in his logbook, the dive wins fights. It was the moment every assumption about the too heavy Thunderbolt died. Only months earlier, veteran RAF pilots had mocked the American machine. They said no four-ton fighter could dogfight a Focke Wolf or Messerschmitt. But Gabreski had just proved that air combat was no longer about who could turn tighter, it was about who owned the vertical. The Thunderbolt was rewriting physics in the cold German sky. Its Pratt and Whitney R2800 engines still roared. Full power where other engines gasped for thin air. In the dive, its weight became a weapon, trading altitude for blistering speed, then using that momentum to zoom back to safety. As the squadron climbed again into the pale sun, Gabreski's calm voice cut through the static. The Luftwaffe's learning something new today, and they were. The age of the turning dogfight had ended. The era of the boom and zoom Thunderbolt had begun. When the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt first reached England in early 1943, it looked less like a fighter and more like a flying oil drum. British pilots who had survived the Battle of Britain took one look at its bulk and laughed. How's that milk jug ever gonna turn with a Focke Wolf? They asked, and the nickname The Jug stuck. Yet, behind the jeers stood a stubborn, Georgian-born engineer, Alexander Cartbell, who believed brute strength could win where elegance failed. After the XP-44 project collapsed, he sketched a new machine on a train ride home, a dinosaur, he joked, but a dinosaur with good proportions. That beast carried the Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp, 18 cylinders, producing 2,000 horsepower and a turbo supercharger system that no other single engine fighter dared attempt. Inside the long fuselage, hot exhaust spun a general electric turbo unit that forced dense air back into the engine through intercoolers. Where Spitfires gasped above 25,000 feet, the Thunderbolt still breathed easily, delivering full power past 30,000. Its armor plate, bulletproof glass, and 850 cal Browning guns made it the most heavily armed single engine fighter in the world. It wasn't built to dance, it was built to hit like a freight train and live to climb again. Pilots didn't love it yet. They complained about the weight, the sluggish turns, and the endless pre-flight checks. But Colonel Hubert Zemke saw something the skeptics missed. A machine that could store energy at altitude and unleash it in a vertical dive no German aircraft could match. The Jug would never win a beauty contest, but if used right, it could win the war in the skies. Spring 1943, England. The men of the 56th Fighter Group waited nervously on the tarmac. Their new mounts, the massive P-47C Thunderbolts, gleamed in the mist. Most still doubted the aircraft could win a real fight. Too heavy, some said. Too slow to climb. But Colonel Hubert Zemke drilled them hard. Discipline first, tactics second. He knew they were about to test an idea that could change the air war. Their chance came on June 12, 1943, during RAF Rodeo 204, a fighter sweep over the Belgian coast. Captain Walter Cook spotted a lone Focke Wolf, 190 below. Remembering Zemke's orders always attack from height, he rolled inverted, dove straight down, and opened fire. The German fighter erupted in smoke before the pilot even saw his attacker. 
It was the 56th first kill, and it came from the top down. The next day, Lieutenant Robert S. Johnson scored his own victory near Bruges, diving from altitude in the same lightning fast strike. But the celebration turned to chaos. Johnson's element leader failed to cover his climb out, and seconds later, the sky filled with tracers. Alone and outnumbered, he barely escaped. Back at base, instead of congratulations, Zemke reprimanded him. Formation discipline, he said, keeps you alive longer than luck. Two weeks later, the jug would prove its other secret. On June 26, Johnson's thunderbolt, nicknamed Half Pint, was shredded by cannon fire over France. The canopy shattered. Hydraulic fluid flooded the cockpit. Even the controls jammed. A German pilot emptied his guns at point-blank range. Still, the R-2800 engine roared on, dragging the crippled fighter across the channel. Johnson belly-landed at RAF Manston, counting more than 200 bullet and shell holes in the airframe. The mechanics stared in disbelief. No fighter that broken should have flown at all. But the jug had. That day, the 56th learned two things. Never fight the Germans' fight, and trust the machine, it might just bring you home. Months before the Thunderbolt ever faced the Luftwaffe, two test pilots, Lieutenants Harold Comstock and Roger Dyer, pushed the P-47C into the unknown. It was November 1942, during high altitude testing over the United States. From 35,000 feet, they rolled inverted and dove nearly vertical to measure the jug's limits. Their airspeed indicators spun past 500, 600, 700 miles per hour indicated before the controls froze solid. The stick refused to move. The aircraft shuddered violently, trapped in what engineers would later call compressibility, the moment when air molecules piled up faster than they could escape, turning smooth flight into chaos. Both pilots were seconds from death. Vision tunneled, G-forces crushed them into their seats, yet instinct and training made them hold steady. They didn't yank the trim or panic, they simply kept back pressure on the stick, riding the fall until denser air returned control around 15,000 feet. Somehow, both recovered with only a few thousand feet to spare. When they landed, the ground crews could hardly believe it. Engineers at Republic Aviation analyzed the reports. The jug's thick wing, once blamed for sluggish turns, had actually delayed the worst compressibility effects, giving pilots a better chance to survive, dives no other propeller fighter could. Training manuals were rewritten overnight. Every Thunderbolt pilot now practiced the hold, don't trim technique, push firmly, ride it down, wait for the air to thicken, then pull out gently. Later models added dive recovery flaps to further enhance the maneuver's safety. Colonel Zemke turned the discovery into a doctrine. If the P-47 could safely dive at near supersonic speed while its enemies disintegrated trying, then the sky's vertical dimension now belonged to the Americans. From that moment, the dive wasn't just survival, it was strategy. By late 1943, the 56th Fighter Group had turned trial and error into science. Colonel Hubert Zemke formalized what every pilot had begun to feel in his bones. The Thunderbolt was not built to turn, it was built to rule the vertical. His instructions were precise, climb above the fight. Attack from the sky, fire once, then use your speed to climb away before the enemy can react. The first full test came during the Schweinfurt-Regensburg mission on August 17, 1943. Hundreds of B-17s droned toward Germany's heart, and the 56th soared 5,000 feet above them, waiting. When Luftwaffe fighters clawed upward, Zemke's squadrons rolled inverted together, plunging in coordinated dives that touched 500 miles per hour. The sky erupted in flashes of tracers. Within minutes, enemy formation scattered. The bombers pressed on, bloodied but intact, the Thunderbolts had done their job. Through September and October, the doctrine matured. Gabreski, Johnson, Schilling, and their men practiced the rhythm. Climb, dive, burst, zoom, regroup. Over Bremen, Frankfurt, and Münster, the 56 struck again and again, executing their dives with clockwork precision. On October 8th, Johnson saved a fellow pilot by diving from nearly 30,000 feet onto an FW-190, shredding it in a single burst. Two days later, 
in a swirling melee near Munster. He became an ace, claiming multiple victories before limping home in a crippled fighter, yet another jug that refused to die. By the end of that month, German squadrons had learned a bitter lesson. To fight a P-47 above 25,000 feet was suicide. The Americans no longer met them in turning duels. They struck from above, unseen, then vanished back into the thin blue. The air war's rules had changed forever. February 1944, Operation Argument, big week. For six relentless days, the skies over Germany became a furnace. Allied bombers poured across the continent to cripple aircraft factories and oil refineries, and the Luftwaffe threw everything it had left into the fight. The 56th Fighter Group flew 16 major missions in that single week, escorting the bomber streams through walls of flak and fire. This was the true test of Zemke's doctrine. At 29,000 feet, Major Gabreski led his squadrons in tight formation, waiting for the climb of German interceptors. When the radar calls came, the Thunderbolts didn't hesitate. They rolled inverted, pointed their noses straight at the earth, and dove into the fray at speeds the enemy could not match. BF-109s and FW-190s tried to turn, tried to climb, but by the time they reacted, the jugs were already blasting through at 480 miles per hour, firing for seconds before streaking back upward. The dives looked reckless, but they were method, not madness. By the end of Big Week, the numbers told the story. The 56 had destroyed dozens of enemy aircraft while losing only a handful of its own. More importantly, the bomber losses had dropped dramatically. Every German fighter forced into a defensive climb meant one less attack on the bomber stream. The Luftwaffe's best aces were gone, and their replacements arrived with barely 50 flight hours. The edge had shifted. Through March 1945, Thunderbolts escorted bombers all the way to Berlin and back, often without a single high-altitude engagement. The enemy simply refused to climb. The Jagdschwader now hunted low, hoping to hit bombers near takeoff or landing because meeting P-47s up high had become a death sentence. When the Thunderbolts began carrying bombs and rockets later that spring, their purpose evolved, but the physics stayed the same. They still attacked from above steep dives, short exposure, fast escape. Whether protecting bombers or striking rail yards, the formula never changed. Altitude was life, speed was survival. By the close of spring 1945, the Luftwaffe had lost control of the daylight sky. And it was the heavy, ridiculed milk jug that had led the way. By the time spring turned to summer in 1944, the results were undeniable. The 56th fighter group had shattered every doubt that once surrounded the Thunderbolt. In just one year, the unit flew 447 combat missions, claimed over 670 aerial victories, and lost only about 60 aircraft in air-to-air -air combat, an astonishing 1-1-to-1 -one -one kill ratio. Even counting weather, flak, and mechanical losses, the numbers stayed above 5-1. to one. No other group in the 8th Air Force matched it. Francis Gabby Gabreski finished his tour with 28 victories, all in P-47s. Robert S. Johnson ended with 27, becoming America's first European ace to surpass Eddie Rickenbacker's World War I record. David Schilling scored 22 and three quarters, and Walker Bud Mahoran added 21. Every one of them credited the same thing, Zemke's doctrine. Altitude, speed, discipline, those three words had turned a doubtful design into a legend. When Gabreski later flew F-86 Sabres in Korea, he used the same formula, dive, strike once, climb away. The speeds had changed, but the logic hadn't. The P-47 had proved that air combat was not about fancy turns or brute courage. It was about energy management and physics. Even German veterans admitted it. You would be climbing for the bombers, one Luftwaffe pilot said, and suddenly your wingman would vanish and fire. You never saw the thunderbolt until it was already gone. By war's end, the P-47 had flown more than 746,000 sorties, destroyed thousands of enemy aircraft, and saved countless bomber crews. Its story wasn't one of luck or beauty, it was a triumph of discipline over instinct, analysis over tradition, and science over myth. The Thunderbolt taught a generation of pilots 
that victory favors those who fight their aircraft's strengths, not their ego. You roll inverted at 30,000 feet, the world tilts, the earth rises fast, and gravity becomes your weapon. One clean burst, one climb back to the heavens, and the sky once again belongs to you. That was the legacy of the dive. That was the Thunderbolt's way.